uh, historical scholarship and the new media. And you may wonder, I have had cause in the past few days to wonder, I certainly had cause to wonder this morning when I ran into the dean in the hallway and I told him what the event was going to be this afternoon. He said, oh, you mean the bloggers panel. Why I didn't put the word blog on the flyers or the posters is because I loathe the word blog. It's <laughs> terrible and the least euphonious neologism I have come across in recent years. But it is what we have and its derivatives, including Blogtopia, Blogosphere, and God help us all, video logging is now apparently known as vlogging, which is probably the first thing that the internet has, which is easier done than said. So today we are going to hear from several scholars who are experts in these fields. Uh, we have with us today Scott Eric Kaufman, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Irvine, Department of English, is what I would call an intellectual historian of late 19th and early 20th century United States history, looking at the influence of evolution on American thought. Uh, he keeps a blog called Acephalus, and is one of the co-founders and editors of The Valve, an online journal. Sitting next to Scott is Tedra Ossell, who is a scholar of 18th century British studies. Uh, she is the author, most recently, of an article called Where Are the Women for Scholar and Feminist Online, and will be contributing to uh, an online forum on online criticism for the Minnesota Review, as I gather. It's not oh, sorry, that's not online. Actually You'll actually have to get it on paper <laughs> and get your fingers dirty. Sitting next to Tedra is Brad DeLong, who is an economic historian and a professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley, a research associate at the National Bureau for Economic Research, and who was scandalized recently when the Federal Reserve Vice President introduced him not as the former Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary for Policy, but as the blogger that <laughs> long. So you can see we all have a slightly uh, a nervous relationship to this phenomenon. Sitting next to Brad, of course, the very own Ari Kelman, who, who is in the king of old media, as you know, <laughs> being associated with the History Channel. I'm walking with Howard Stern. Audio <laughs> 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 page death <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, you may wonder why, why uh, I had the idea to ask these people to talk to this. I do believe that there is a, uh, uh, that blogging particularly is having an important impact on scholarly discourse. And uh, we'd like to hear from some people who have been at the front lines of that. I noticed because I do read some blogs, I'm privy to the information that if you pick up the current issue of the French teen girl mag Jeune Jolie, which you can get for de euro sumo, um, you will find among the various headlines, my group of girlfriends are my life, and uh, also how to get what you really want, but also blog mania, pourquoi bloguer? So I want you to know that we are up there with Jeune Jolie and our concerns here in the department. And without further ado, I will turn this over to the panelists, beginning with Scott Eric Kaufman. So, Scott. Yeah, I'm going to remain seated. Uh, I should stand up. It's your choice. Um, <laughs> well, uh, when Eric invited me, I guess five, six months ago, I think that's how it was, he said, you know, I just want you to come to talk informally about what it's like to, to do history online. And as, as an endeavor, you, it, it, it's something that's difficult to imagine. <coughs> Historical research is very detailed. It's very detailed. Where you, it's very difficult to share in the midst of a research project why anything that anyone would really want to read. Right? I mean, it, it, it's kind of inherently uninteresting. And I didn't want to say that. Um, uh, but we, I mean, as, as we kind of sit in the archives, just going over and over what seems to be just countless iterations of the same thing, you think, okay, well, how, how would that translate into any kind of online experience that you could share, that anyone would, would actually want to share uh, with you? And as I was trying to kind of organize my thoughts, I realized I shouldn't really talk about any of that, because it's not what I actually write about. It's not what, say, on the Valve actually goes up. It, it has almost nothing to do with the kind of detail-oriented um, work of life. Uh, life as a life as a scholar, and it's much more to do with creating a sense of a scholarly community, one that has its own kind of code of ethics, its own responsibility, and it's something that we don't actually. I I don't want to speak poorly of, of, of this department. I don't know this department, but I know many departments uh, uh, in which there is no real sense of academic culture anymore. There's no sense of shared interests, of shared concerns, and 
and I'm getting blank looks. People are like, no, we, we all share interests here. We, we, we have this thing. We talk about this all the time. But in my experience, and, and, and given the number of readers I have, especially at, at the Valve, which, which is really a kind of, you would think, a small coterie type blog. We do literary theory. Uh, and yet, we're getting five, six, seven thousand hits a day. Um, we get upwards of 2,000 comments a month. Um, not all from the same three people, even though it sometimes it seems that way. Um, but there is a real sense that people want to actually engage with other academics in a way that all of the bureaucracy um, kind of gets in the way with in everyday culture, uh, in everyday kind of like in a department. You can't talk to the, you know, your peer about this because you're going to be competing with him for this grant, that grant, yeah. which kind of pushes the graduate student competition <coughs> uh, metaphor maybe a little too far, but there is always an awkwardness to kind of interdepartmental communication. Um, and what something like the Valve, uh, and to a much, much lesser extent, um, uh, my own blog, Acephalus, uh, does is it, it provides a space in which I throw out an idea and I get honest responses from people across the disciplines. And um, as, as Eric very nicely called me an intellectual historian, um, I, I feel like I'm not, I, I am kind of boxed in to a, doing a certain kind of work in an English department when what I do is a kind of social cultural history. I'm looking at primarily print culture, but that's because I'm working in the 1890s, early 20th century. You work with the print culture, that's what, that's what you have. Um, but I, I'm not necessarily interested in, in literary issues. And, Well, not purely literary issues. Um, and so, as, uh, as an example, I, I offered um, to anyone who wanted to read my most current dissertation chapter, I, you know, I, I, I just put out an offer. I said, okay, whoever wants to read this and give me feedback and attract changes, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to, to get feedback from across the board. I got uh, 66 people who wanted to read it. <laughs> um, Jesus. I had historians, lawyers, linguists, English professors, um, one very intimidating English professor, um, uh, kind of, in, 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 in terms of my, my uh, lineage, uh, uh, intellectually, it's my advisor's advisor, so uh, I was a little nervous about sending it to him because I had not yet actually sent the chapter to my advisor. I was seeing the advisor. Um, and, that could have been very awkward. Um, but the, the kind of feedback I got, I, I think is very indicative of the kind of intellectual environment I've helped to create, both on A. Sevels and about, because it is interdisciplinary in the, in the best sense of the word. It's, it's feedback that, I mean, it's one thing to have a lawyer kind of pick through your, I don't know if you've ever had a lawyer pick through your prose. Um, as an academic, but there are lots of things about academic prose they don't like. Um, there are also lots of things about legal prose I think we don't like, um, and that I was supposed to write. No kind of um, but getting that kind of feedback and being able to discuss my work in that kind of environment is something that I think is going to give birth to a, and I don't want to sound too utopian here, although I realize we're all going to sound a little utopian here, um, but I think it's going to give birth to a new kind of intellectual culture. I think it already has. I think we're already uh, seeing that to a large extent. But I think it's going to kind of really change the way we, we think about our work and, if nothing else, create even more tension um, than there already exists as to how to produce good work. That is work that you know, exists according to certain disciplinary strictures. Um, so, for instance, I, I, I once got a chapter back um, where it said uh, needs literature, and that was kind of it. I, really, I, I, I thought it was very well done, but apparently I didn't have the um, ostensible uh, topic in it at all uh, as an English student. Um, and well, I, I kind of want to wind it down because I was told 10 minutes and I'm pushing that. Uh, but. I'm more than happy to kind of continue the discussion as to very specific kinds of things that can be accomplished in an online environment that can't be accomplished, say, in a seminar room. 
um, phenomenon like everyone talking at once and it still being intelligible. Um, getting ideas from absolutely everywhere and it still being a kind of constructed environment as opposed to one that is necessarily hostile, which is normally, I mean, it, 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 it could seem like the war against literally the entire universe, all of them have some quibble with something that you've written. Um, and so I'll, kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm more than happy to kind of continue in the Q&A session uh, talking about my, my ideas for how to kind of make this, uh, regulate this. And I say my ideas. I'm building uh, very much on the work of my, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the editor of the ballot, John Holbo, who has many ideas about how to create kind of uh, a humanities version of what they have in the sciences, ex archive. Ex, ex archive. I've never had to say that out loud before. I think that's sounds nice. Um, but thank you. Well, that's a nice kind of like segue. So, I think Scott has it backwards. <laughs> I have a I have a really utopian idea of what of what blogging specifically in the web kind of more generally can accomplish. But to me, the idea you know Scott said stuff that can happen online that can't happen in the seminar room. And to me, it's it's precise. One of the things that I love about online communities and blogging and commenting and all that kind of stuff is that. It recreates stuff that can happen in a well-run seminar on a much, much bigger scale. Um, so I have a really uh, idealistic, kind of optimistic, despite the fact that everything really pisses me off, I still have an optimistic view, ultimately, of the, of the idea of being online as being a way of kind of uh, creating a public sphere. Even though at the same time, I mean, everybody knows that there's all sorts of arguments against cover moths. Um, I think, you know, does it get realized? No. Does everybody have access to a computer? No. Does everybody have time? No. Um, but does, does the fact that people think that, it, that being online is sort of universally accessible help to create an idea, a fiction, an enabling fiction is the phrase that I always keep, that I always use, an enabling fiction of you know, a truly democratic public sphere? I think yes, and I think that that's a really interesting thing. Um, what I wanted to talk about, though, was to kind of put it, this in historic context. This is my attempt to sort of make my <coughs> role as expert in blogging, which is really easy to become, right? Like, you just log in, you create an account, woo, you're an expert. Um, actually seem semi-academic, um, because I do 18th century studies. I did my dissertation on early essay periodicals, and one of the things that was interesting to me about them, and that I ended up focusing on, was that it's a generic feature that they are always pseudonymous. Okay, so the author never puts his name on it. The Tatler is written by Isaac Jacob Staff. The Spectator is written by Mr. Spectator. The Rambler is the Rambler, and often it's. Um, the title and the name of the, of the editorial persona are the same, but not always. But they are always kind of fictionalized. And what I was saying there is that it's, it's an interesting way to create a kind of public voice that is sort of stripped of issues like status and you know what your political affiliations are known to be. Um, and also, formally, it, it makes it really easy to have other people write more than one person writing for a periodical over a length of time, but create a kind of consistent voice. Um, I didn't start blogging because I wanted to, to actually do that myself, but then once I started doing it, I, I realized, oh, this is kind of what blogging is like. Right? You, you write these things that are purely idiosyncratic and personal, and you can write all, you know, you can do a fairly wide variety of content. So, like the Tatler started off, he did public stuff, he, who are the 18th centuryists? One, two, okay, awesome. Wait, what we <laughs> so most of you don't know this. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll go into detail. So in 1709, Steele was the author of the official government, the Whig paper. Um, and he started off this project on the side called the Tatler. It started off saying, satirically saying, you know, there are so many members of the public who, you know, are so publicly uh, minded that they neglect their own business to gather in coffee houses and, and talk about affairs of state. And so, you know, this, the Tatler is going to teach these people what to say. 
um, or how to think, I forget which, which exactly. But so it starts off kind of satirizing both the medium itself, but also the audience. And he offers it free, which is very sort of blog like. And then afterwards, it's two pennies. Over the course of the thing, the ads become the revenue, right? Which is how periodical uh, publications still work, but also how blogs work if you make money off them. Um, and the first, he, this is the first few issues, he tells gossipy stories about you know some young gentleman who's fallen in love with a lady that he's seen going by in a coach, and now he's not eating anymore. And he satirizes political stuff, and he reprints news that he has access to. You know, he's doing this at the public government table, and he's anonymous, and you know everybody, right? Which means the people in that particular sort of social class are wondering who's writing it. Um, by the time he's done it for two or three months, there are other people imitating this genre, um, this kind of emerging genre. And the, the imitators cover this amazingly broad range. There's religious ones, there's uh, weird, satiric, dialogic ones where you'll have two people, two characters arguing back and forth, um, and the actual implied claim that the paper's trying to make is, is demonstrated only by the ridiculous of their argument, right? So it's it's like portraying people that, that are mouthing voices that the author actually objects to. You have political stuff. Steele does his dreams. Um, there's a really fun one called The Female Talib that actually competes cleverly with Steele for a long time by publishing on alternate days. Um, and at one point, the original author takes, goes and finds a new publisher to publish the thing. And the original publisher hires someone new to provide the content. And for about a month, the two papers argue back and forth about who's the real Mrs. Krakenthorpe. And one of them says, you know, my man has run away and is pretending to be me. You know, and the other one says that, you know, you know, she doesn't say the word bitch, but you know that high blah blah blah, she's just, you know, she's pretending to be something that she's not, and how dare she act about her station, all this stuff. So I mean, there's these inner paper wars, there's all sorts of content, but they end up being, ultimately, you get this sense of persona, of person, of voice kind of coming from them. In the long run, you get magazines and, and non-newsy kind of periodicals, which is really neat. And I think that the 19th century, and up until about the 50s, the 1950s, the scholarly reaction to these things the historical reaction to these things was they really opened up the public sphere. You know, suddenly anybody could get access and publish something. They started including, they included years letters. Um, suddenly anybody could read them. People would read them on a lot of coffee shops, so there was that whole, that sense of access, which it wasn't really that broad. <coughs> At its height, the Spectator had 2,000 had a circulation of 2,000, and there were like over 200,000 people living in just London alone at the time. But if you think about it, I mean, that's a really huge percentage. Um, if, you, if the circulation was primarily confined to London, which I'm sure it was, 10% is a, is a good percentage of all of London reading this thing. And you get the same kind of discourse now about blogs, that you know they're really opening up access, they're really opening up the idea of, you know, who can influence political discourse, who can influence policy. Um, you know, it's the, it's the old media of the newspapers scared and worried because the blog is just or whatever. Um, and even though I think that, that that those claims are a little, what, they're a little bit over, they're a little exaggerated, I think that the fact that the claims get made is is interesting, and I think it's something that's worth paying a lot of attention to. Not only what is eventually going to happen, if, if the essay periodicals turn into magazines, and really did change the culture of political and social discourse, whether or not they were fully inclusive, um, in what ways are blogs really changing political and social, social discourse, whether or not they truly are as inclusive as we'd like to believe are the, are the questions that I'm kind of interested in thinking about. So, return. Let me try to be both broader and narrower. 
um, that is a little bit more focused on the university and also a little bit more extended in time. That is, Scott goes back to 1890 or so. Um, Tedder goes back to 1700. Um, let me go back to June 5th, 1224. Um, when Frederick II Hohenstaufen, uh, Emperor of the Romans, King of Sicily, King of Germany, King of Jerusalem, Duke of Swabia, etc., etc., um, Frederick II has a problem. He's trying to rule an empire. It's 1,100 miles, though, from Hamburg to Palermo as the crow flies. It's more like 1,400 miles as the messenger rides. Figure a month to get a message from one end of the empire to the other, and that's if you're lucky, if it's not winter when the snows have closed the passes over the high Alps. <coughs> so in order to try to hold his empire together, um, Frederick needs clerks, Frederick needs judges, Frederick needs people who can read the messages he sends, and people who are attached enough to the idea of public order that they will actually obey them. Or at least tell the thugs with spears on horses in the neighborhood that they'd better obey them or the emperor will be coming, and he has the biggest army of all. Um, so um, Frederick's predecessors had relied on monks and bishops right, for this purpose. Um, they're literate. They respect authority. Um, they spent a lot of time reading since the New Testament is kind of the canonical source of what they do. But then popes began to assert that they should appoint bishops, that the pope rather than the emperor should appoint the bishop of Cologne to be somebody who the pope thought it was convenient to appoint rather than somebody who the emperor thought would make a good administrator for the central realm. And then popes began to assert that they should appoint not just bishops, some, and abbots, but that they should appoint emperors as well. So bishops, monks, and even laymen trained at the monasteries and at the church-dominated universities of northern Italy under the ideological hegemony of the megalomaniac Pope Innocent III, um, these people are out. And Frederick has a problem. He still leads his clerks and his judges. So what does he do? Well, he founds a university, um, what is now the University of Naples, Frederick II. Um, quote, we have therefore decided that in the most pleasant city of Naples, there should be teaching of all the arts and of all disciplines. Frederick promises that the graduates of the University of Naples will have a very clear career path. Quote, our subjects, after having become learned, will be granted nobility, wealth, and the grace and favors of our friendship. Therefore, we invite scholars not without merit, and will entrust them with the administration of justice once they have been unable to do so. And Frederick makes Naples sound um, rather like Berkeley. Quote, he will allow you to live in a place where everything is in abundance, where the homes are spacious, where the customs of everyone are affable, and where one can easily transport by sea or land what is necessary to human life. And he even appoints a rent control board. <laughs> and has unusual ways of making sure his university meets its enrollment targets. Unquote. We order, therefore, all of you who govern provinces um, to command, under danger to person and to goods, that no student will dare leave the kingdom to study, and order those students outside the kingdom to return by the feast of St. Michael. This made me think of my conversation with Princeton Dean Michael Rothschild, who said that Princeton's financial aid policy was intended to make sure that no student whom Princeton wanted would go to UC. Uh, perhaps Arnold Schwarzenegger should take some lessons from Frederick II. Um, so, and Frederick closes by inviting students to come to the University of Naples for this great task. And so you set up scholarly communication in 13th century Naples. And its pattern is clear. Um, professors who wish to teach must gather in Naples. Um, and they'll talk to each other, and especially talk to politically reliable persons who take the imperialist as opposed to the papal line on theological issues, people like Raffredo of Benevento, whom Frederick names as rector of the university. Students will talk to each other and listen to professors. And one more thing. Students and professors will read books. And a lot of the reading in books will be done aloud. In its origins, right, a lector is one who reads aloud. Um, a lecturer is someone who stands in front of the lecture hall to read the book aloud right, to the students. Um, moreover, these books are really expensive. 
Right. There is one more passage I found interesting in Frederick II's Lictora Generalis, um, announcing the university, which was his student loan program. Right. That loans will be given to students based on their needs with the pawning of the students' books, which will be temporarily returned after having received the guarantee. The student will not leave the city until he has paid back his loan or has given back the books <coughs> to the loan holder. The only security measure required for student loans is that if you want to leave the city, you give the lender your books before you leave the campus. Your books are that valuable. Frederick, um, and presumably Rafrido, who we presume drafted this, um, assumes that nobody would default on their student loans at the cost of losing their books, uh, their few books their hand-copied, expensive, monk-labor illuminated books. So that's scholarly communication in 1224. You know, time passes. Um, Gutenberg sets up his printing press. Books become cheap, um, and things change. And let's jump forward to December 10th, 1513, um, to Niccolo Machiavelli, who, like Frederick II, has problems. Um, Niccolo Machiavelli's problems stem from the fact that the Florentine Republican government, headed by standard bearer Piero Soderini, that he had worked for, <coughs> the government where he had been, um, say, best minister of confidential affairs, is probably best, um, has been overthrown by a coup, a coup backed both by the church and by the neighboring superpower, France, that thinks that the Florentine Republican government is a little too uppity. So the Medici dupes are now in control. They torture Machiavelli to see if he knows anything more interesting. They then tell him to leave Florence, to wait in the country nearby, to have no meetings and hold no conversations that might make the Medici suspect that he's part of any anti-Medici <coughs> conspiracy, and to stay in Florentine territory. Um, so Machiavelli heads out to the countryside, you know, where he does four things. Um, First, he worries that the servants of the Medici will knock on his door and drag him back to the basement of the Palazzo Vecchio to torture him or possibly kill him some more. Um, second, he tries to distract himself from his worries by finding what diversion he can in rural life. Third, he polishes his own, quote, little book, his book about techniques of power in which he adopts the authorial pose of an amoral technocrat, because he is at one level an amoral technocrat who would rather serve his city and be back in the confidential affairs game even if his city is ruled by the Medici dukes rather than by the republic, rather do that than rusticate at the countryside. And maybe if he can convince the Medici he's useful, they won't torture him anymore. Um, and, and this is what I thought was most interesting when I first ran across this. He spends a lot of time inside a big virtual reality machine. Quote, on the coming of evening, I return to my house and enter my study. And at the door, I take off the day's clothing, covered with mud and dust. And I put on garments regal and courtly. I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where, received by them with affection, I feed on that food which only is mine and which I was born for, where I am not ashamed to speak with them and to ask them the reasons for the, their actions and they and their kindness answer me, and for four hours of time I do not feel boredom, I forget every trouble, I do not dread poverty, I am not frightened by death, entirely I give myself over to them. What's happening here? Machiavelli goes into his library, and he reads for four hours. And it is a transformative experience for him, which for anyone sitting out in the countryside waiting for your torturers to come back. Um, but um, he's, man, for him, it truly is um, having a library, being in, say, the third generation after Gutenberg, not having books be so scarce that they are security for your student loans, having a bunch of them that are yours. Um, that's a very new thing that creates for Machiavelli a whole brand new, wonderful scholarly community. And he really does imagine that he's talking. And I know from my own experience, at least, and maybe I'm simply totally weird, um, that this is true. You know, like I spoke to Milton Friedman maybe 10 times in my life. 
Um, but he was a very big intellectual presence for any economist at the end of the 20th century. And I find when I think back, I can hear his voice saying things I never heard him say. Uh, that my brain is sufficiently not quite right. <laughs> that the transition between print, right, um, between parole and long, say, um, is erased. Um, and this is a wonderful thing. Okay? Now you can talk about how books are inadequate as virtual reality machines, you know, and we do. You go back to Plato in the Phaedrus saying Socrates says that books are inadequate, that it's much better to have Socrates in front of you than just have a book. Um, and of course the argument of the Phaedrus is undermined for us by the fact that we don't have Socrates in front of us. All we have is a book, um, a book in which Plato tried to give the experience of a conversation with Socrates you know, but didn't quite succeed. Too many of the interlocutors are just, um, that's very wise, Socrates. Uh, but at least he's trying. Um, so maybe it's a second best, but it's a durable second best. It's a second best that can be spread out all over the world. Um, the fact that cheap books exist as virtual reality machines to convey yours or others' personas and ideas to us. You know, it's a wonderful, it's a utopian, it's a superb thing. It's a thing that we all feel, or we wouldn't be here we'd be out doing something else. But it isn't quite enough, and so we still have our universities, right? The coming of the cheap book didn't destroy them. Um, and we go on our round of attending classes, trying to get our advisors to read our work, fearing lest our advisors read our work prematurely, um, going to conferences to talk to people who aren't part of our local intellectual community, going to departmental meetings and hoping to have some intellectual exchange there rather than just bureaucratic sniping over who has to teach the course, and spend a lot of time in the library reading things. Um, and things that, you know, close as they are, don't quite, you know, talk back. And so now let's jump forward to the year 2002 for my third example. Um, and this is a story that I have heard three times, although it's never been written down, it's purely oral. And it's come to me in three different ways. In some versions, the person is on the West Coast, and the telephone call comes at an absurdly early hour. In other versions, the person is on the East Coast, and the telephone call comes at an extremely late hour. Um, what the truth of this story is, I do not know. But the story is UC Davis economics professor Greg Clark answering the phone and the voice on the other end saying, I want to dispute your estimate of the weight of the 12th century Scottish ox. <laughs> and at least as the story comes down, um, through the oral tradition, inaccurate as it is, but we're referring to the story as a social fact, rather than the truth of the events that occurred, Greg has three reactions. The first is, does this person know what time it is? And the second is, how dare this person dispute my authority? I know more about the 12th century Scottish ox than anyone else. And third is, here's someone I can talk to. Here's someone else who's actually interested in the weight of the 12th century Scottish ox. <laughs> Which is, if you're thinking about material culture, standards of living, and economic development in the core of the Middle Ages, are quite an important and interesting topic. And so that even <coughs> As we are now, right, even eight centuries after Frederick II, with extraordinary developments of literary and intellectual culture, with universities funded on a scale that would make Rafferudo of Benevento fall down on his knees and praise God, um, even with current UC budget crunches. Um, even now, we find that we're not still remarkably far from utopia because the only other person in the world who is seriously interested in the weight of the medieval Scottish ox you know, isn't next door. And the hope, the promise, the utopian promise of the internet is that you will be able to construct on the fly, actively engaged intellectual communities on a world scale rather than just those people who happen to be in the social sciences building at this particular moment and aren't sufficiently harassed with teaching and administrative courses. Um, on the other hand, you go on the internet, and you allow comments on your weblog, and you get all the people from Nigeria who wish to offer you an extraordinary financial opportunity <laughs> writing as well. 
So let me stop there because I've used up enough of everybody's time. Second um, is that I don't really have, and maybe this is the point in a, in a panel on blogging, I don't really have any credentials uh, to be offering this uh, comment. Um, I mean, I, I guest blogged for a friend once uh, for two days, um, and I hated it. Uh, so, you know, um, having said that, uh, I just noticed something really remarkable, and it may be uh, one of the principal virtues of blogging, or what blogging can uh, do for all of us, uh, and that's that we just saw three people present uh, in a university setting, and none of them went long. Uh, I, I, I never, I, I, I'm, I'm actually being very serious. I've never seen such a thing before. Uh, and so brevity uh, is something that I, I think really we should take away from this. And I, I actually mean it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm partly kidding, but I, it's, there's, there's an element of seriousness. Uh, I, I was, uh, I have to say, uh, Kathy told me to be funny. Uh, she, said, you know, she knew that I didn't have any ideas, and so she said, um, you know, just make a lot of jokes. Uh, that might work. Um, and so my, my big gamut was that I was going to do this in pajamas, uh, because there's this notion that everyone blogs. Uh, the, the greatest thing about blogging is that people are sitting around in their pajamas at home, you know, eating haagen as they're composing their stuff, and, you know, occasionally uh, shooing their cats from the keyboard. Right um, but I am so tired these days that when I even thought about putting on my pajamas, I fell asleep. Uh, so plan B is that I wrote my comments all at one sitting, uh, and I haven't edited them, uh, and that they have uh, spelling errors uh, in fact, This is an homage to Matthew Iglesias, who's a political blogger who doesn't seem to be able to spell hat. Um, so I want to start uh, with um, what seems to me a... Uh, an article of faith among most of the academic bloggers uh, that I read, and I hope it won't be too unwelcome here, uh, and that's that uh, we historians, uh, maybe more broadly, humanists, social scientists, are, are in the midst of a, uh, of a kind of crisis. Uh, this is a crisis that stems either from a lack of interest or maybe a related inability to communicate ideas uh, anymore in ways that anyone but our very closest colleagues uh, can either understand or, or really even should bother caring about back to the weight of the ox, which though perhaps extraordinarily important, it's just very hard for me to muster much enthusiasm. Uh, I, 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 I apologize. Uh, I'm not going to do that. That would be a huge mistake. Um, so if, if you don't accept this premise, uh, and, and I suspect many of you don't, and, and that's fine, but I would invite you to read the books that cross my threshold for review. Uh, or to read the journals that uh, all of us are supposed to uh, be contributing to and reading, uh, even the very, very best ones, uh, consistently read them, or really at your peril, and if you have an extraordinary amount of time and courage, go to a conference and actually attend the sessions. Uh, don't sit in the bar with your friends, uh, go and watch, uh, what's that? Don't look at me when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in the bar with my friends. Um, there are, of course, exceptions to this, and I know that. Uh, there are really great books. There are papers that are presented uh, that are wonderful. There are good journals, et cetera, et cetera. But I think increasingly, uh, whether these actually are exceptions, uh, the good ones, that is, um, we feel like they're exceptional. And certainly academic bloggers, I don't want to paint you all with this brush, but it seems uh, I'm picking and choosing from things that you've all written at various times. Uh, academic bloggers seem to feel this way. Um, and so the question is why, I guess. Uh, and I don't know for certain, obviously, and I'll, I'll give you sort of the standard answers for historians. Uh, the usual suspects are, you know, the impact of, of the new social history on narrative. Uh, which is to say we don't narrate so much as we used to, or nearly as well. Uh, the infusion of social theory into our writing, 
uh, which, uh, you know, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, for lack of a better way of putting it, sort of the structural constraints of, uh, of academic employment. Uh, that we write for a particular audience to be promoted, uh, particularly within the UC where we've got this, this odd uh, way of, of getting raises, which, you know, I like, but it means that we're constantly writing uh, for, it seems in some ways, ever smaller audiences. So the question then that emerges out of all of this, uh, it seems to me that the papers I think are raising, or, or the, the various things that were pre-circulated are raising um, uh, another question beyond just uh, a rationalization for spending a lot of time in one's pajamas, um, and that's are, are blogs a symptom or a cure uh, for this? Uh, are they, in other words, a, a, a way to better communicate our ideas to uh, ideally a broader audience? Uh, not surprisingly, it seems that, that all three say uh, in, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, yes. Um, I'm not totally convinced, I have to admit, uh, but I'm going to start with positives. Um, the reasons that people, that, that we've been told we should be blogging or at least reading blogs. A uh, place to start, it seems, uh, for this is, uh, as ever, with academic bloggers Habermas. Uh, and uh, this is another piece of conventional wisdom in the blogosphere along with the crisis and the pajamas. Um, and, and that is that uh, there, we are witnessing, we are, we, are, we are undergoing another structural transformation of the public sphere. Uh, academic blogging, so goes the argument, democratizes scholarly discourse. Uh, it invites more people into the coffee house, um, as it were. Uh, Tetra? 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 Sorry. Uh, suggests that, and I'm now quoting, uh, I don't know if this was a post or a paper that you gave, but you have to forgive me, the line gets blurry. Um, quote, the limits of Habarazian optimism are too well known to need recounting. Yeah. Um, but the necessary academic practices of qualification and specificity ought not, I think, to overshadow the real accomplishment of putting, or even seeming to put, specialists on a level playing field with enthusiastic amateurs, reactionaries, and even the idle and bored. Really sounds like a paper. <laughs> that was that, that's this. Like, that's the draft of ideas that I did. It was online, so I'm allowed to quote from it, right? Uh, so I'm not criticizing it, by the way. I'm 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 just going to go on to say that I try and avoid the idle and board, except when I teach. <laughs> um, avoidable. Um, but there is something extraordinary. There is something that seems to be remarkable about the prospect of being able to share one's ideas. Uh, with a potentially massive audience of interested readers. Uh, and surely, I think we can all agree, though that's a lousy rhetorical strategy, I know to say it in that way, uh, that it's nice that the members of that audience need not be credentialed. Uh, so the blogosphere might not be as democratic as Habermas's public sphere, which itself wasn't as democratic as Habermas would have had us believe. Uh, blog readers, we know, are typically, typically now white, uh, very well educated and, and certainly affluent enough to be able to afford both the computer and internet access. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a broader public um, than we normally reach. Uh, at the same time, um, and perhaps of even greater value, this seems interesting to me also, the relationship between blogger and reader can be reciprocal. Uh, as site visitors, uh, as Brad just said, provide comments, uh, which turn into conversations, even debates sometimes. And best of all, from my perspective, though scary, the interaction plays out over the course of seconds uh, rather than the geological time frame of academic publishing. Uh, you put your ideas out there, someone reads them, and they very, very quickly say, you're a nitwit, you haven't read my book, and it happens that fast, you don't have to wait for the reviews. Um, it's very, very handy. Uh, Scott Kaufman um, adds uh, another uh, positive that's his reader's sweeping uh, expertise. The physicists, the classicists, the literary scholars, the historians of various stripes, the philosophers, the sociologists, did I say that twice? Uh, the classicists, on and on and on, all these people who are reading his blog. This, it seems to me, is really very promising. If we're going to continue to fetishize uh, interdisciplinary scholarship while all the while ignoring the fact that it's really hard to do that kind of research in a balkanized setting, a setting balkanized by discipline, like a university, this may be a way to actually do it. Blogs may be the way that genuinely interdisciplinary work will happen. Uh, that's exciting. 
Hoffman also says uh, that you have to write well, or that you have to communicate clearly, at least, as you're doing this. Quote, the diversity of the crowd forces me to find some way to communicate with my readers in terms they'll understand. Emoticons, right? Um, <laughs> Now, uh, Brad, um, it, I think, is, is not just talking uh, in, in some of what he uh, was writing about, about the public sphere, uh, but also about public space. Uh, the, the, the idea uh, that uh, the internet collapses space and time. This is a 19th century notion, annihilating space and time. It was steamboats, then it was railroads, now it's computers, uh, woo-ha. Uh, and Brad, I have to say, I, mean, I, really, I need to make fun of you, because he writes this thing about uh, all the brilliant people down the hall from him at work and the view from his window, which apparently frames the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and he's still dissatisfied and admits that he is, quote, perhaps a bit greedy. Uh, to which I say, after considering the view from my window, which is the interior courtyard of this building, and the losers down the hall for me, Louie, <laughs> Alan, Kathy, uh, Sally, you're laughing, and you. Uh, that, yeah, you really are uh, a bit greedy. But, um, what he's really talking about here isn't a nicer office. Uh, he's talking about, quote, an invisible college of more people to talk to, pointing me to more interesting things, people whose views and opinions I can react to, who react to my reasoned and well-thought-out opinions and the ones that aren't. Now I'm paraphrasing. Goes on to say, it'd be nice to have Paul Krugman down, uh, three doors down so I could bump into him occasionally and ask, hey, Paul, what do you think of? Uh, that really all does sound good. Um, I don't know if I want Paul Krugman down the hall, but <laughs> it, it sounds pretty good. And again, this idea. Yeah, very polite. Really? He's very polite and very friendly in person. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, the idea, though, again, of this annihilation of space and time that somehow Berkeley can be collapsed into Princeton, uh, that is where he is, isn't it? Uh, or was? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, uh, this, you know, this, is, this is very, very promising. So far, so good, right? So sign me up, uh, www.somegoodname.com, um, or org, or whatever. But here are the cautionary notes. Uh, first of all, uh, Scott says that blogging, and I'm really paraphrasing you now, and so feel free to say that I'm wrong, but it, 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 one of the things that he wrote, that it ups his confidence in some ways, that it allows him to view senior faculty as peers, uh, and, and that that might help him on the job market. Um, all of which sounds very, very good in theory, but I don't really know that the equality that exists in cyberspace translates to the AHA. Uh, that is to say that the blogosphere might provide an artificial sense of leveling, uh, an illusion of collegiality where it might not actually exist. I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure. It's an, uh, it's an enabling fiction. An enabling fiction. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, add to that, uh, this is my another cautionary note, blogging really isn't for everyone, even when I did it uh, for those two days, I learned that. It takes an enormous amount of time and energy. Uh, forget writing a blog, actually being responsible for its content, its originality, its ideas. Instead, just try reading three or four blogs over the course of two weeks. Uh, I have found, personally, that the experience, while edifying, can also be really crippling. Uh, you may occasionally walk by my office and hear me muttering aloud, get back to work, and then you hear Mike Saylor next door shuffling his papers. <laughs> He's really neurotic. Uh, but I'm talking myself, of course. Uh, and, and worse than this is the fact that the energy that goes into blogging isn't rewarded, uh, yet at least, um, in a university setting. Uh, Brad suggests that actually it may be in some respects, and I think all of you do, that it may make your writing better, uh, that it may clarify your ideas, that in fact there are rewards for this. Brad explicitly talks about the idea of raising your profile, which brings perhaps its own set of rewards. Uh, but I don't yet know that the cost-benefit analysis works out. I, I, I don't. I mean, I think we'll have to check back with all of you in a few years. Finally, my biggest worry, uh, and then I'll stop, um, is whether or not blogging actually makes for better writing and clearer thinking. Uh, so whether or not this is a symptom or a cure. Uh, there has been a thread, a recurring thread over the past few weeks, I suspect it's recurred for longer than that, on a number of the blogs that I read about whether or not blogging is actually destructive to your prose. Whether or not your prose becomes more clipped, it's more rushed, you don't have enough time to think. So I got in touch with a friend of mine who is a blogger full-time uh, and a PhD in history, a very good historian, could have been uh, a truly great historian if he had devoted himself to that. Uh, he said he's not sure. No, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm saying he decided not to. He, he makes money from having a blog. He's, he's, 
be dispensed with this whole history nonsense. Uh, his name is Joshua Micah Marshall. He runs a, a blog called TalkingPointsMemo.com, which is a big uh, lefty political site. And he said uh, that his big concern is that blogging is becoming too fast-paced. Too much, in his words, like a 24-hour cable news cycle. What he said he really wants, in addition to an office that overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge, um, is a few days away from his blog. Uh, time that he would spend, and I'm quoting him now, thinking or even resting. Uh, so if rest is the real goal here, then you really can count me in. Uh, and if I get to wear my pajamas, so much the better. Um, as some of you know, I've already got the right chair for it upstairs. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to all of our commenters for a most edifying session.